Great. So we are going to just do some quick um, introductions and then we will hear from tonight. Our um, guest speaker is from Little Sis um, and then we'll do some Q&A and some to talk some next steps. So yeah, just before we get started, we ask folks to, you know, do as best, you know, I know it's hard in the evenings, there's lots going on, but as much as you can, remove distractions, um, get a beverage, whatever you need to, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your body um, and center yourself so that you can, you know, get the most out of this session. Um, so yeah, so my name is Taylor Smithhams. I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior organizer with 350.org's US team, and I'm based in Baltimore. Um, all right. So yeah, just want to hear from folks before we get started um, talking about power research. How, just put in the chat, how do you define power? What does power mean? Lots. Knowledge. Ability to influence outcomes. Yeah, all three, totally valid. And what else? Any other motion? Interesting. Making a difference to get your way. Energy per unit time. What else do folks think of? Comes to mind as people power. Yep. The ability to force someone to do something they would not otherwise do. Responsibility. Mm. Awesome. These are all great. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And yeah, can folks can keep thinking about power. Um, and that's really what we are going to talk about tonight. So we are going to be learning from Lauren Parker, um, who is with a senior researcher in the climate program at Little Sis. They have over, when little sis, I love to say, is the opposite of big brother. I think that's so clever. Um, so they have over 12 years of research experience, with many of those years working closely with organizers, activists, and community members to advance campaigns for housing, environmental, and education justice. Prior to their role at Little Sis, Lauren supported ambitious local programs and policies designed to protect renters facing eviction and led data-driven analyses to support federal environmental policy. They received a master, master's degree in city planning and urban spatial analytics from the University of Pennsylvania and a BS in geology from the College of William and Mary, and they are based in Philly. So welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much. Really excited to be here. All right. Is that my cue to start sharing some slides? Yeah. Great. Go for it. Okay. Um, all right. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. Great. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat while I do this. We'll see what happens. But um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm Warren. Use they, them pronouns. Um, as Taylor mentioned, I'm with Little Sis. I'm a researcher there. Um, so this will be a training on an introduction to power research, the ins and outs of what that is. So let's see. So in this, we're gonna talk about, well, we just had this question, what is power? So we're gonna go a little bit deeper into that. It was a great setup, thank you. Um, we're gonna talk about power research. How does it help our campaigns? Um, we're going to tease out like when we talk about a corporate power network or power structure, like what does that mean? How do corporations or in this case, you know, utilities really amass power and influence? And then we're going to talk through a real life example, SEMPRA. Um, there may be some SEMPRA campaigners um, on this training today, in which case I would love, you know, at that point, like I would love to hear a little bit about your campaign and what you know about SEMPRA and you know, what type of information um, might be helpful too. I'll share a little bit of research that I did and then we'll go into a Q&A. Um, you know, I'm, we'll see how long this takes. It might be about 45 minutes with time for Q&A. So, all right, let's jump right in. So for anyone who's not familiar, Little Sis, we're a small organization. Um, we are a research organization primarily, we work and are grounded in movements. Um, we work closely with activists and organizers um, to really research the financial elite. We research 
uh, and map powerful people and organizations. We also do a lot of trainings like this one. We have a free monthly um, uh, power research training, which I'll have a link to at the end of this training if you want to join. Um, that's coming up. The next one is, I believe, June 20th. I'll double check that date. And then we also are a tech organization too. We have um, our database, which is called Little Sys, which is free and open source to use. And it's this wiki where you can upload information about powerful people and organizations. And then we have a tool that kind of sits on top of that, that lets you actually make visualizations to map out um, those powerful people and organizations and the relationships between them. So let's see. All right, so we already actually did this. Um, we had a lot of great ideas about what is power. So I heard Watts, energy, knowledge, um, ability to influence outcomes, motion, ability to make a difference, or people power, responsibility, uh, the ability to like force someone into action. And all those I think are like, great definitions of power. Um, I think one really concise definition could be the ability to make the world how you want it to be, even against opposition. And we can think about that as, you know, the power that we have as people that are part of collective struggles. We could think about that as the overdogs, um, you know, the folks that we're in opposition with, um, those people in power who want to maintain their interests, maintain the status quo. We can think about, you know, the power that we have and the power that they have as well. Um, and so what are some like dimensions of power? We at Little Sis like to use this framework that we're pulling from a newer book called Practical Radicals. Um, highly suggest this book. They also have an accompanying um, podcast that's really great. But the authors put out six forms of power here that we can talk through. Um, they have, and these types of power can apply to, you know, grassroots people power movements or, you know, the financial elite. Um, so solidarity power is one form and that's really like collective action that recognizes some shared interests. So it's the power to work together. It's the ability to form networks and that could look like unions, it could look like campaigns that we're in together, mutual aid groups. It could also look like nationalist movements too. Um, so disruptive power, it's the power to uh, you know, disrupt. It's really non-cooperation with the status quo. And that could look like a lot of different things too. It could look like strikes, blockades, direct action, or it could look like, um, you know, how the police are used to disrupt movements and infiltrate. Um, that's also disruptive power. We have this third form of power, economic power. And really it's like described as the ability to control the production of goods and services. You know, who has wealth, who has access to resources? And we could think of, um, you know, the financial elite having economic power, big bosses, billionaires. Um, but we can also think about our own collective economic power and also um, engaging in strikes and boycotts, for example. This fourth form of power, ideological power. So it's the power to really, you know, set norms and values, um, kind of beliefs about what is right and what is wrong. It's how we like make sense of the world. And you can kind of think of that as, you know, what are the institutions that kind of set some of those norms? Certainly faith-based organizations, our education system, um, news, media, our workplaces, um, our respective cultures, and even institutions like think tanks. Um, but in our movements, we have, you know, narrative development. We have messaging, you know, to really kind of like set some of the norms, um, set some of our values, put that out into the world. Um, political power. So political power um, is defined here as like the ability to reward and punish. Um, 
to set rules to distribute and withhold resources and services, kind of similar to economic power. Um, and of course, some of the institutions that have that type of power are courts, police, uh, you know, legal structures, uh, our elected officials um, who administer these programs and set budgets, um, our judges, et cetera. And then finally, they separate military power from that. Um, so it's, they described, the authors described here, um, military power is the ability to use or threaten violence in somewhat of a different way and under different rules, really, and accountability than like police power. Um, so we have these six forms of power and it's, I think it's helpful to kind of think through at least this framework, there's many frameworks for how to understand power about like, you know, what types of power do we have in our movements and how do we understand our opponent's power and potentially weaken it strategically? All right, so let's move on. So if we're thinking of the power structure of the financial elite, we, we really focus on the power of the people and their organizations and institutions that are really benefiting from the status quo, who are really trying to stand in our way as we change the world. So this, this is like the network between these people and organizations and institutions is what we describe as like the power structure. So who's in this structure? Who's part of the power elite? Um, we can ask some of these questions to really tease us out. We can say, so who's governing? Who's making these decisions? Who's benefiting from the status quo? Who has you know, been accumulating wealth? Um, and who gets their way in these policy fights? Who, who really benefits from some of the policies that we see? And I like this diagram. Um, it's kind of describes a couple pockets of the power elite can talk about the corporate community and looking at, you know, executives, boards of directors, CEOs. And then we can look at um, some of the network of so-called experts within the policy field. So like academic institutions, think tanks, who's on their boards, et cetera. And then also, you know, the, the more like financial elite uh, billionaires, wealthy people with influence. Uh, and, you know, we can kind of start to tease out how individual people from these various pockets are all connected to each other. And also think through that, you know, each connection that they have to each other, it's a relationship that they need to maintain. Um, and we can expose those relationships and use them as pressure points to try to weaken some of those, the power um, of this, this overall structure. Um, so this is where we get into power research. We research who these people and organizations are. We research what is the nature of their relationships. Where can those relationships, you know, form points of leverage that we can can pressure? And um, you know, we follow the money, we follow the connections, um, we map out these relationships in what's called power mapping, and it informs our campaigns. Um, how might it help our campaigns? We can get a better sense to this type of research who on who are the targets that we're focusing on, who can really make the decisions. So we're not just uh, directing our efforts at maybe the most obnoxious person who seems really, you know, nefarious, but maybe doesn't have decision making power, we can really go after who is the person that can make these decisions and make the change that we want to see. Um, we can also help, you know, this can help identify who our allies are, who's willing to kind of be persuaded and brought to our side. And we can also use power research to locate shared targets. Um, so maybe there is someone who is on the board of a university um, and also a big landlord in the town that we're in. And we have many movements. We have the campus movement and also our housing justice movement who say, oh, this person could make a lot of changes across these different dimensions. They could be a shared target. We could work together. 
um, to really kind of pressure this person to, to get what we want. Um, we can identify points of leverage, create wedges, apply pressure so that we can really weaken corporate power. And also we can expose contradictions. Often corporations like to put out a very positive public image, of course, but when we do research and we see, you know, who, uh, what their actual business practices are, what violations or what lawsuits have they been subject to, or, you know, how much uh, profits they're making uh, at the expense of the communities that they so-called work with, you know, we can start to expose some of those deep contradictions and expose some of their actual practices. Uh, we can also clarify our demands um, and also be more strategic in how we form our tactics, our narrative. So how do corporations build power and really try to protect their interests? Let's start to kind of build out this web a little bit. All right, so if we're thinking about a corporation or, you know, like, let's say a corporate utility, what are some ways that they um, might, what are some questions that we wanna ask to really understand their power or how might they, they like amass their power? Feel free to put that in the chat and I'll try to look. Okay, we wanna know who makes the decisions, great. Are they lobbying? Yeah, and who are they lobbying? Awesome. What else? Intergenerational wealth. Yeah, how did they how did they get that wealth too? Budget for lobbying. What products do they have to hurt us? Yep, what are some of their business practices? Political donations, absolutely. What else? Think tanks, yep. So which <clears throat> think tanks are they connected with? What is the bias of the think tank? Regulatory capture, yes, yep. Who else do they know? I love this, okay, oh my gosh, this is so great. Yeah, the boys club. All right, so let's see, if did we cover all of them? Yeah, we wanna know about who's in leadership, who can make the, those decisions. So we look at who is their CEO, who are their top officers, and who's on the board? And also, what is kind of the like the biography of these, these folks? Like, where have they had positions? What other boards are they sitting on? Um, we also want to know investors and shareholders. We want to know what political network are they connected to? What politicians are they connected to? Also, charitable giving is a big one. So nonprofits, philanthropy, that's a big one and their business operations. So if we have these different dimensions that we wanna look into, what kind of questions can we ask to really start developing some of this research? For their leadership, we talked about this a little bit, but we wanna know, you know about who are the people in charge? Uh, what groups are they connected to? How much do they receive in compensation? Especially um, for private corporations, Board members are paid huge amounts of money. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to Sempra, but you know they get in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to serve on these boards. Um, what do folks, you know, these people in leadership, what do they seem to care about? Um, do they try to keep out of the public eye about certain things? Can we leverage that? Um, and also, are they connected to various academic and cultural institutions that we could pressure, for example, are they also connected to other trade groups like chambers of commerce, for example? And about the investors and shareholders. So it's it's good to know, you know, who has the majority stake in some of these corporations? Are there banks, for example, that have offered them lines of credit or counseling? And for public um, publicly traded corporations, can we look to see, like, are there shareholders that are proposing some resolutions for things like better, um, you know, accountability and transparency around their environmental practices or their environmental impact? Um, how are they responding to some of these more like activist shareholder proposals? 
political network. So we want to ask the questions, what politicians are they donating to? Um, and then what legislation are those politicians supporting and opposing? Um, does the corporation hire lobbyists? We'll also talk about this when we get to SEMPRA. And are there any revolving door connections? So meaning, you know, are there former politicians that are now hired as lobbyists for the corporations? Are there, they're basically, you know, individuals that have gone in between this revolving door of a corporation and also elected positions. In terms of <clears throat> charitable giving, often corporations might have a foundation and that um, by being a nonprofit, they have to report um, about some of their practices publicly. So we can look that up and we can see, you know, who do, who do they give to? What kind of grants do they give to? What do they ask of their grantees? Um, are they connected to any sort of academic or cultural institutions? And, um, you know, corporations will often form these charitable arms or wings of the of the of their corporation to kind of present a more positive image while still maintaining a lot of their their practices that are often predatory. Um, so we can kind of cut through some of that spin if we look a little bit more closely at what their charitable giving, so-called charitable giving looks like. Um, are they giving to groups that might be at odds with our campaign in other ways? Like sometimes um, utility corporations might give to police, police foundations. Um, and then finally, yeah, somebody else that somebody else asked this uh, or proposed this was looking at their business operations. How do they operate? How do they, you know, un how do they sort of think about risk? Um, what are some of their legal issues that they're navigating? You can look at their revenue and profits. Um, do they have any lawsuits? Um, have they been um, issued any violations in any way or have any public controversies? And especially for um, utility corporations, this is a huge thing. Um, we'll see with SEMPRA that there's uh, been lawsuits around how they've set their prices. They've had violations around some of the toxic gas releases that they've been responsible for. Um, and some of this is, is information that you can look up quite readily. Um, and bring that into the sort of public sphere where they have to really answer for it. And it can be a way to really agitate people and mobilize people to be part of this campaign. Okay. So um, this is a very quick, going to be a super quick overview. If there's time at the end, I'd be happy to talk through specific research tools. This is a quick one. Um, one thing that I like to start with is like, it's, you know, it's, we're in a, in a moment in time where there's so much information online and it's so powerful. Um, the internet is so powerful. There's so many tools out there, which I'll talk about, but I also like to just stress that, you know, we, um, there, how do I say this? Um, the important, I, I like to stress the importance of like in-person research meetings where you can actually try to meet with people in your community um, about a particular issue that you're fighting um, to understand like, who are the people in power? What do they care about? How can we really you know, pressure them to do, to make changes that we want? Um, who else should we talk to? I think having those types of meetings, whether it be with you know, block captains, uh, faith leaders, um, community leaders that you know, or even meeting with like elected officials who are sympathetic and, um, you know, allied with you. I think that can generate a lot of really deep information that maybe is not online. Um, so, you know, just a plug to say um, an in-person research meeting is really, is really a great thing. Um, you can draw upon your social connections, you can use this information to really hone your sense of targets and allies, and sometimes use it to really just like ground truth or correct some of your web-based research. So I'll put a plug in for in-person research meetings. 
And then, you know, we have a lot of web-based tools available to us too. This is a really quick list um, that I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about, but, you know, we just talked through what is the information we wanna know. And so on the right hand is just a really quick list of where to find it. So if you wanna know about CEOs, board members, definitely check um, the corporation website. Usually they list their bios. Uh, you can check their LinkedIn. You could do some targeted Google searching to find them and find what other boards they may sit on. In terms of executive compensation, if it's a publicly traded corporation, they have to report on things like this um, to the SEC. You can find these filings probably most easily on the corporation website. Usually they'll have a tab that says investors, click on investors, go down and search for what's called an annual report or search for something called a proxy statement. And I'll have a bunch of information about their, you know, the compensation to the board and to the CEO, their business model, how they talk about their business. Um, if they have, you know, so-called ESG standards and that sort of thing, it's in there. Um, and then also who are some of the majority owners too? That's usually really great. Um, privately held corporations, it's a little bit more tricky, but sometimes you can find that stuff online too. For foundations and nonprofits, there's this great tool that ProPublica puts out called Nonprofit Explorer. You can just go to this link, drop in the name of the nonprofit, or even the person that you want to research that's on the board of a nonprofit and look up um, all of their the forms that they they are required to submit to. Um, yeah, there's really great information there. Whoops, let me go back up. For campaign donations and lobbying, I would first say look at opensecrets.org. They have a tab called Donor Lookup. You can go there, enter in the name um, of the organization or the individual donor that you wanna put in there and see what politicians they've been giving to. That's mostly just for federal, <clears throat> um, federal races, but you know, your state or your town, county, or municipality usually has um, some, some, you know, database available. Sometimes you actually have to go in when it's like the more local races, you kind of have to go into um, your local office and, and pull some of that information. It can be a little bit more spotty. Um, and then finally, if you want information about some of the like environmental violations and lawsuits that corporations have um, been subject to, there's this great tool by Good Jobs First called a violation tracker. And there's some stuff in there too. Um, all right. So that's a really quick overview of some web-based tools that can be helpful for power research that we use all the time at Little Sis. Happy to answer some questions about some of those at the end as we have time. Um, oh, one last tool I'll just mention in case it's helpful. We at Little Sis, we just put out this microsite called the fossilfuelfinancehub.org. Um, you can find really how um, financial institutions are propping up fossil fuels. So you can kind of start mapping out those connect connections as it's helpful. You can see um, there's just a, a list of great tools, for example, and like here we're looking at tools to understand how much banks are investing in the fossil fuel industry. So it's really just the centralized hub of different resources to do to do that, some of that type, type research. All right, cool. So let's hop into SEMPRA. Um, I heard that there might be folks campaigning against SEMPRA on this call, possibly. So does anybody know anything about SEMPRA that they wanna share or wanna talk about the campaign a little bit? I don't know if anyone's here right now. All right, totally well, fine. We can um, we can do this together. So Sempra is, um, let me scroll down on my notes. So Sempra is one of the largest energy companies in the US. They claim to have 40 million so-called consumers. Um, this is a web of 
SEMPRA, its various subsidiaries and the board members and CEO. But if you look at the top of this web, um, you can see that they have subsidiaries. Southern California Gas is um, an energy provider as is Encore and San Diego, San Diego Gas and Electric. And then they have the separate wing, SEMPRA Infrastructure, which holds their um, so-called LNG or methane gas projects. Um, they have the Port Arthur LNG project, they have Cameron LNG, and then two other proposed um, methane gas projects in Mexico. So one thing, uh, just looking at this is, yeah, one thing to just point out, so Cameron LNG, is um, a methane gas uh, project in Hackberry, Louisiana. They have come under fire, rightly so, from local residents and activists because they've had dozens of toxic releases, faulty equipment. Um, and in while sort of in the middle of this have received over $3 billion in tax subsidies. Um, so there's been big public outcry for really the like environmental and human impacts of, of this particular um, LNG facility. Um, and that's, you know, that's just something that's happening as part of their overall business model. Um, so there's a lot of folks that are campa campaigning right now against SEMPRA. Um, and I guess one thing I will point out here is, um, well, let's maybe, I'm sorry, I'm like kind of switching course just a little bit here. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, how they exert their influence. So they have an extensive lobbying, lobbying team. Last year, they paid $2.7 million to lobbyists to really advocate for legislation to advance their interests. Um, they were fined $10 million in 2022 for lobbying against efficiency standards that would have saved, um, you know, their customers' money. They have a corporate PAC. Uh, they donate to a long list of different uh, political candidates. They spend a lot of money on that, almost a million dollars. They also have this foundation uh, where they give millions of dollars in small grants to various projects as a way to kind of burnish its image. Um, they pay off lawsuits. They've had dozens of lawsuits over the years for some of the ecological and environmental devastation that they've caused. They've also um, you know, been engaged in price fixing and misusing ratepayers money, improper billing, and also not reporting some of their toxic gas releases that have happened. And then they have, you know, a set of board members that are well connected to major industries like oil and gas, transportation, finance, tech. Um, they also have a couple board members that have prominent positions or had prominent, prominent positions at various universities. And we'll talk through that a little bit. So their lead independent director, their lead board member is CJ Warner. Um, she has had a long career in the oil and gas industry, working at um, Endeavor, which is now Marathon and BP. She's also a board member at Chevron. And she's currently has positions, governance positions at Vanderbilt, at their School of Engineering, and also at Columbia University at their Center for Global Energy Policy. And so previously I mentioned, you know, that board members get compensated quite well. And so in 2022 for her role on the board, she got paid $345,000. Um, and that's, you know, to handle various roles, but to attend a grand total of about a dozen meetings throughout a year. Um, She's donated to politicians that are pushing false solutions like carbon capture and storage. And so, you know, this is all research that might be helpful in trying to locate, you know, where are there ways that we can uh, drive wedges or, you know, um, create different pressure points. Um, 
And I want to just ask the question, you know, to everybody here, I'm going to skip over this for a second. So <clears throat> giving this kind of overview of information, talking about power structure of the financial elite, what types of information might be helpful in campaigns, and then looking at this little snapshot of SEMPRA and one of the directors, CJ Warner, um, and some of the connections she has uh, to academic institutions and also the oil and gas industry. Are there any sort of thoughts that come up? How might this information be helpful in your campaigns that you're trying to structure right now? Do you have questions about, you know, like how can we put this into action? Open question for the group right now. Can I ask a question? Of course. I think this presentation you just gave is brilliant. And the problem is that this type of information is not readily available to people like us in New York running campaigns against the utilities. It, so how can we make it more accessible? Yeah, is it um is it that you're up against a utility that's private? Well, they're monopolies, you know, Con Ed and National Grid. And yeah. they bring in all their buddies, you know, the API and all you know, they're all in it together. They've blocked several major, major pieces of legislation that would result have resulted in um transition to renewable energy. Yeah. The um, all electric housing bills is is quite prominent. But yeah, I think I don't remember anyone on that campaign talking about this type of attacking the power structure. And it was only after the fact that we lost that you know we found out that API, American Petroleum and all their buddies had put millions into into crushing this legislation. Yeah. I can't know off the top of my head uh, what information is out there, but I think if you could get a sense of who's on the board of the various utilities, which usually is public, um, you can look up their names in a tool like opensecrets.org and see who they're donating to. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and it also has now information about the lobbyists too, like their lobbying activities. So I would say that's another great place. That's a great place to start is opensecrets.org. Um, yeah, I wish I knew knew more about, you know, the New York landscape a little bit better, but um, I would say starting there, starting with their board websites is a great place. Um, looking on some, uh, I would say some, you know, business oriented websites, like sometimes Forbes has announcements um, that are helpful about, you know, new directors or investments. Um, I think sometimes that can be helpful if there isn't other information readily available. Right. But the, we, I mean, to my knowledge, they never did that. The, mm. You know, we, New York and using the big coalitions that were fight, uh, fighting for those bills. They their concentration was on the politicians, the legislators who who could have voted for this bill, and it was a done deal before we even started because we never looked at the at you know the people who were trying to block it, which were the people that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yep, and the politicians, you know, who, some are honest, but well, I won't, we won't go there to spend the rest of the afternoon and evening talking about that, but uh, they didn't come through. Most legislators didn't come through. And we don't know, you know, obviously they were under pressure from these organizations you're talking about, the utilities and, and their friends. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it can be hard to know also when and when, like what information to pull, 
um, to have the capacity to do it um, and how to use it. So, you know, that's our hope here at Little Sis that we can uh, build up research skills across wow. our movements. Yeah. And so that, you know, we can we can all be doing this type of research too in our campaigns. Right. Um, all right. So I'm switching over to the chat a little bit. Heard from Rachel that Little Sis search feature and deep linking is nice. Great, good to hear that. Um, I'm seeing from, I think, T that I can't, if I can't locate a 13F filing on a college with over a hundred million in assets, what does that need, mean? Is it filed under a different name? It could be that, yeah. I would have to kind of look through that particular case to tease that out, but it could just go by a different name. Um, and then we have a question here from, or a comment here from Jeffrey. I can imagine publicizing this info to make her uncomfortable or institutions uncomfortable with her, but not sure how that helps change policy. Yeah, and so that's really a, you know, a question about strategy. So if you have this information about a particular director who is on a utilities board and has deep history with the oil and gas industry and is on um, in positions of power in academic institutions, you know, how do you use that to really get what you want? And that's where I think some of the art of campaign strategy comes into. Glenn says, seems like the connections would be useful if they uncover conflicts of interest or violations of corporate sustainability policies. Yep, pointing out those contradictions. Thank you. Yep. And... Okay, we got that one answered. And then Laura says we can get a lot of info, maybe not all the info. That's a great point. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any other thoughts that are maybe just bubbling up right now about your individual campaign, how you might want to use power research? All right, then we are at this open Q&A. So if there's other questions too, happy to do my best. I got a few um, like direct message to me so I can say those. Um, so one was about like going through SEC reports um, and like just asking for more specifics on like which reports, which sections, like how, like where to find the information that, that people need. Love this. Let me share again. Um, okay. So I included a slide just in case this question came up. If you go to Nonprofit Explorer, um, you will see that they have, um, if you look up a nonprofit, you'll see a form 990. Um, Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Are we, hold on, let me stop the share real quick. Let me pull this up real quick. Okay, so for the SEC filings, I would say um, if you wanna look up um, like executive, probably the first place to start would be the proxy statement. Um, and that's also called a DEF 14 uh, filing. And within there, you'll have information about what uh, will be voted on at their annual meeting. You'll have information about executive compensation and board compensation. Um, you'll have the board members' bios. Um, you'll have, if there's any sort of uh, resolutions brought up by some of the shareholders. You'll see that too. And you'll see how the board recommends you vote on them or the, how the board recommends the investors vote on them. So yeah, I would say start with a proxy statement that has a lot of information. And if you wanna get more information about kind of like their business model um, and even how they understand risk and revenue and profits, I would say go to their annual report. 
Awesome. So and then, cool. Yeah. And then there was one more um, about like compensation. How do we find out about perks and benefits or are they included in total compensation? That's usually, and this is all if it's a publicly traded corporation because um, they're required to submit these filings and it has this information. That's also in the proxy statement. Um, that should be like, it should usually be separated out quite a bit because they try to lay, lay out their different perks, um, you know, whether it be travel reimbursements, um, different like uh, stock awards, their actual, you know, cash benefit that they get for being board members, like all that should be really laid out in pretty decent detail in the proxy statement. Awesome. And then there's a couple in the chat. Um, so Daniel's yes. asking, do you have any ideas on how best to deal with the California PUC? Oh, that's such a big one. And um, I wish, you know, I have to say that I spent the better part of the last like eight years mostly focused on housing and tenant organizing work. And so I personally am somewhat new to like, utility fights. Um, but I can create a list of any questions that I can't really get to. I can try to create a list here and ask my colleague, Rob Galbraith, um, cause he's, you know, been involved in a number of utility campaigns. Um, so he might have some thoughts about the California's PUC. Do you have any additional sort of details on what might be helpful with that? Well, the problem is we haven't, I'm sorry, I just jumped in. Um, we haven't had any really good ways of dealing with them because when you look at them, just when you just look them up, there's nothing glaring. There's nothing that specifically ties them to the utilities. And yet every decision they have made in the last five years has been detrimental to the people of California. Um, and I, uh, even talking about this just makes me insane. So I try to stay calm and look for ways to approach the problem. Um, because I just can't, I just can't imagine that these people really are looking at the public best interest with the decisions that they're making. I mean, it's just, some of them are almost comical. Like, here, let's take away the right of people who live in multi-unit housing and in schools and in churches to have solar, or at least to have any 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 solar that they could pay for. I mean, how do you just go, hey, sorry, not you people. How do you do that? How is that legal? I don't get it. Yeah, that's um, that's a big one. So, and I know that that's like a common tactic of a lot of PUCs is to, and utilities really to try to um, suppress any real legislation or efforts around solar. Um, and so if you've already looked through, you know, some of the professional biographies of the commissioners and you've looked through their political donations and um, and tried to do some like, you know, targeted Googling around what other professional affiliations they might have and are really coming up with nothing. Um, I think that's, that's also the moment where you can um, try to consider doing these like research meetings too, to say, do we know anybody who, knows these commissioners, would they be willing to meet with us and we can have an informal conversation about, you know, their motivations, what they care about, um, who else we should be talking to. Um, and I think, you know, there are folks in the room here now that are, um, you know, have more wisdom on this than I do, but I think just lifting up that that inherent conflict that you're pointing here, which is like, they seem to be more aligned with the corporations that they should be regulating rather than the people that they should be serving and protecting. 
Um, so just, you know, trying to lift that up in that messaging, which I'm sure you're doing too. But yeah, I'll try to try to bring this back and see if we have any information about the California PUC. And LB just put um, still on the, the California PUC, um, like we're told not to antagonize them, but to play nice. And I guess I'm, I think that's always an interesting tension of like, you know, when is it politically beneficial to try and, you know, play nice? And when is it like, you know, like Daniel was saying, if they've been making decisions that are negatively impacting people for years, you know, I'm, I'm curious where that advice is coming from or who's saying that. Um, I mean, this has been this has been going on for at least five years now, and we 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 played nice in the beginning, and and when there was NEM two point oh, and we played nice in the beginning when we thought oh they couldn't possibly vote for NEM three point oh, but they did, and we played nice and and now and now it just seems like they're just throwing things in our face, just hey. How about if we do this? How about if we do that? And it's not just solar. It's anything that isn't owned by by a shareholder owned utility, Semper to be specific. I know the governor appoints them, but our governor doesn't seem to care. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I'm sure Lauren has more thoughts on this, but in terms of if, yeah, if like you do all that, that research into the commissioners themselves and aren't seeing a lot of direct connections, if since they are appointed by the governor, that is a really good, you know, additional target to focus on. Um, should we move on to another question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Sherry's asking, um, pretty specific. So how do you find out who the donor was if it's listed as a donation for Act Blue on the campaign donations report? Okay, so this is something that we've recently had to kind of uh, untangle. I think, I think what happens if you're looking at Open Secret, OpenSecrets.org or even um, some of the federal databases too. I think sometimes donations made through Act Blue have get duplicated in a weird way, where you have a donation that says it's from Act Blue, and then like if you look kind of in the record, like right under it, it'll have the actual donor name. So sometimes sometimes you have to just double check that it's not a duplicate of an existing record. Um, I would check through that. I think, um, let me see if I can kind of point you in the right direction. Uh, let's see. Okay, if you go to the FEC's website, there is there's a way to dedupe it and doop doop do let me see where it was you know it's going to take me a minute to look for it let me write this down and then i will send it back to taylor if you don't mind and then if you don't mind like sending that out but yeah i think usually that that is like a duplication error Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, Duncan is asking, how do you estimate which power relationships can be most effectively disrupted? I think that's another question that really gets at like campaign strategy. Um, it's, and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this, you know, like, I think part of it is asking, you know, like, what do we have the capacity to, to do? Um, do we have the capacity to structure direct action that could pressure this person in a way that feels like it could be fruitful? Um, you know, do we 
do we have strengths around like comms and narrative development? And maybe we like think about, you know, who we can kind of pressure in a public way. Like, do we have people who could write an op-ed that can highlight different, you know, if we want to, my coworker Rob was just telling me how in one of the campaigns he worked on, he wrote an op-ed um, in Buffalo, uh, really challenging the local utilities um, argument that they had to raise prices. And he really showed that, you know, that board members and the executives were getting paid obscene amounts of money um, and that, you know, their profits were increasing for this corporation. So, you know, do you have, it's kind of a balance about, do you have capacity in certain respects, in certain respects? Do you have strengths in certain areas? Um, and, you know, yeah, I think other just considerations within the campaign. Is there anyone else on this call that would love to like, you know, respond to that too, about how they make decisions around campaign strategy? I think something that can happen is if you are going after a specific target and it's not, you know, it's not leading to change, like that can then kind of force you to, to identify alternative targets or kind of do this like, okay, if we aren't influencing them, who can influence them? And then you can kind of work that way. Um, so that's definitely something that's happened in campaigns I've been involved in. Karen, do you want to share? And Joe. Yeah, this is actually Joe. Sometimes, you know, looking at the diagrams, it's you're evaluating for pressure points and trying to determine what's the best way to pressure a relationship that could give you the outcome you want. Uh, I remember one story where one relationship was a business owner. So they said, okay, we'll talk to the business owner, see if we get them to talk to his friend. They wouldn't. But then they started protesting the business and the business owner came out and said, oh, what do I need to do to get you all to go away? And they go, well, you need to have a conversation with X, Y, Z. So they were looking for that type of pressure points is uh, one way to look at it. I love that. Thank you for that example. All right, anything else? Okay. Any other questions for Lauren? All right. Well, thank you so much for, yeah, this training and for sharing all of these resources. Um, I, we, will, I will also put them in an email follow up email. Um, oh, we do have one. Allison, do you have a question? Can you hear me? I'm having uh, internet connection issues. Yeah, we can yep. hear you. Okay, great. So along these lines, I'm doing some work with the United Nations right now. And it seems like every nation but the U.S. has a delegate to the International Criminal Court. And um, I'm wondering if there's some way, particularly people on this call, we can get together to, uh, well, first of all, is that true? The United States is the only, only, only one without um uh an official position on the international criminal court and you know climate change has been designated um a crime against humanity and um all life on the planet and it just seems that 
there's a lot of individual work being done, but maybe there's a collective effort that could reach out and, you know, work with hopefully the uh, re-elected administration to help them help us with membership in the International Criminal Court. I don't know. I, it's just something that I just started thinking about yesterday, and it, obviously it's not clear, but there is a resource there that there we are not tapping into perhaps successfully as we could, although I'm sure the lawyers of many of our groups are. Just any thoughts on that or corrections in my thinking or, you know, shut up, go away, Allison, you know, whatever. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I actually, I wish I could comment on this with some sort of expertise, but I just, I can't. Um, but if there's anybody else in the, in the webinar here today that has anything they want to share about that, please feel free. We got Greg. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the United States doesn't uh, recognize the International Criminal Court or submit to it because they're, you know, they'd be afraid. Of something. You know, George Bush and Dick Cheney would be in for the Hague in chains if 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 they did. In fact, they just uh, the the Senate or the House just voted to sanction uh, the International Criminal Court for indicting uh, uh, Israel in their in their Gaza situation. Right, right. I didn't I didn't want to kind of go into all of that. So that but as organizations, some of the organizations on this call are involved internationally or North American wise. It, it, we cannot do this as a representative collective. But I agree with everything you said. And I, I know this is a, a wild conversation for another time, but happy to pursue it with anybody. Any lawyers here in the group would be great. All right. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing all of these tools. Um, and like I said, we will include them in our wrap up email. Um, Lauren, did you have additional slides you wanted to share? You know, I'll share uh, just two more things. Um, we have a website that might be helpful. Let's see. We have our power lines. 101.org website, which goes specifically into the power and influence of electric utilities. There's a lot of great reports and resources on there. Uh, in the last couple of months, some of my coworkers put out a report um, about rate cases um, in case that might be helpful for anybody here. And then if you want to keep in touch, if you have additional questions or questions, you know, that I wasn't able to answer, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, my email is lauren at littlesys.org. We have all of the social media on there. And then we also, I mentioned before, we have monthly free trainings. Um, it's the third Thursday of every month in the evening. If you go to mapthepower.net slash, I have to move this, training series 2024, you can register for them. It's like this training, but a deeper dive. Um, so this month, We'll be looking uh, more deeply at nonprofits. Last month was corporations. Um, yeah, we'll also, you know, in subsequent months, we'll be talking about billionaires and sort of these like state power networks, statewide power networks. So um, feel free to join us. And also, if you like our work and have a couple extra bucks to spare, of course, feel free to support our work too. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and we just have a couple of last other things to plug. Um, so this is, yeah, this is part of our series, um, our utilities public education series. And next week's session um, on Tuesday the 11th, 
We'll focus on the IRA's direct pay program. Um, and we are going to be hearing from the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. Um, so this is like a really tangible, like there is money on the table um, and like how to access it. Um, so it should be really practical and hopefully can support, um, you know, you and some of your, all of your work to deploy renewable energy projects in your communities. Um, so definitely be sure to join us for that. Um, and yeah, so just a couple other things. Um, you can join our Slack, um, which is a great way to stay connected to each other. Um, and also just have, yeah, so you don't have to kind of go through this funnel um, like of reaching out to us. And then we can, you know, you can reach, there's a lot of knowledge in this space. So we want people to be able to to talk with each other and share ideas um, in a more democratic way. Um, this is the link to register um, for that session next week um, and you can invite a friend. Um, and then we'll be taking a few weeks off um, and then coming back with some more trainings in July. Um, and then I also wanted to um, plug this um, week of action in August around utilities. Um, so it'll be in August, uh, the 12th through the 18th, through the 350 Network Council, People's Action and other national partners are gonna be taking action together across the country to send a clear message to our elected officials and utility companies that we are demanding affordable energy, a just transition to renewables, health and safety for ratepayers, and energy democracy. Um, and so we have an interest form um, where if you are interested in organizing an action in your community between August 12th or 18th in support of those demands, um, please fill that out. Um, there will be like a map where we'll put up all the actions and a toolkit coming soon, but just wanted to flag that for people that like, you know, if you are already working on a campaign against your utility or you want to start, this can be a good, you know, a good way to kind of add some energy and, um, you know, press and attention and recruitment work, um, for, for your campaign. Um, so yeah, those are all of, all the things coming up and, um, we'll put this all in the follow-up email, but thank you everyone so much for, for being thank here tonight. You. And thank you again, Lauren, for sharing your expertise and all of these amazing tools.